Well, hello there, ladies and gentlemen. This is Ray Dolan from Mullingar, in Mullingar, promoting what's good and great about our town and the opportunities, and it's a fantastic place to live. But we're here at the St. Lomans Hospital, which is a, a very historic building, and it, it gave it a lot of employment to a lot of people over many, many years. And I'm here with Mullingar's historian, yes, the famous Ruth Illingworth. Ruth, we're here having the crack, as I say, at the St. Lomans Hospital. Ruth, when did this place open or where did we start, as I say? Where did we start, Ray? And it's great to be here again with you. Yeah, this is one of the most historic buildings in the town. And as you said, it was a place which gave huge employment, often to generations of families in Malangar. The hospital dates back to 1855. My and God. We're actually standing beside the original buildings, very fine Victorian era architecture. The architect was a man called Charles Wilkinson. He also designed the railway station in Mullingar. Oh, really? Yeah. And um, he uh, was uh, employed to build this in 1855, and it opened that year. Right. Uh, and its original title was the District Lunatic Asylum for the counties of Meath, Westmeath, and Longford. Yeah, they, and they, tell the me, language like, was a bit rough then. It was a bit So at that <laughs> yeah. time, I mean... Most of the people who are coming in here, what, why, how did they manage to get in here, or did just their relations sign them in, or in what some was... cases relations signed yeah. them in, and others they would have been signed in perhaps by doctors or by the courts. Mm. Uh, many of them would have been suffering from genuine men mental illnesses yeah. for which there was no drug treatment at that time. Others, however, ended up here for reasons that had more to do with, for example, in the case of young women. Uh, to guard their morals, I think, or to save them from harm. Oh. Uh, that's how it was put anyway. Uh, there were people who were sent in here by their relatives because the relatives wanted the land they had. Yeah, I heard uh, them stories all right, yeah. That unfortunately happened. Uh, in 1886, they began to transfer a large number of women here from the county jail in Mullingar and from other prisons were beginning to close jails at that time Wow! Uh, and the women were often transferred from the prison to St. Lomans and that caused problems actually because when all the women arrived there simply weren't enough wards for them so for quite a while they were actually under canvas in, in the, the grounds of St. Lomans until they could build uh, new wards for them. Just say hello there to Sally and to Bernadine uh, and Amanda. So if you're out there watching folks, just press that share button and share this all over the world because I mean we're sharing a good bit of history here with the legend, ladies and gentlemen, mm -hmm. Ruth Illingworth. Sorry Ruth, I interrupted no, you no, there. What did the people do here then at that time? Did they have a job or uh, did they just lie in bed or what? No, they, they did have uh, jobs, at least some of yeah. them did. Now some of them wouldn't have been capable really of doing any work but those who did, the men in particular, were often sent out to work on the farm. Yeah, and there's tons of land out there. Like. Absolutely. Yeah. In 1902, the hospital uh, acquired some 420 acres of land here for a farm. Wow. Uh, and it became pretty much self-sufficient. I mean, it really was kind of like a town with it in a town here. And many people were in the hospital at that time? Uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, there were about 850 patients. Um, 850 patients. I think about 300 staff. Wow, it was uh, a little town as right. It yeah. really was. And they had shops as well. I mean, there were shoemakers. They, were, uh, they wore a uniform. It really was kind of a very much an institution. And like prisoners and like people in the workhouses, they had a kind of uniform of tweed jackets for the men and really quite dull colours for men and women. Well I had a feeling like I was out back there and you walk along that uh, bypass road there and I just had the feeling of people out there working on the land nearly yep. half half shod as I say I yeah. mean in bad condition like I just got that feeling of of just walking through the land. Yes I mean yeah. it was uh, I mean the, the the male patients in a way were better off than the female ones because they did get out into the fresh air. Right. Yeah. Whereas the women seemed to have been indoors most of the time. And yeah. I'm not sure what they were working at, but I think knitting and sewing would have been a part of it. Uh, and the um, the staff were originally known; they were referred to as keepers. Wow. Uh, and the female staff. Uh, they weren't really regarded very highly, although the, many of them were quite highly trained. Yeah, but, but a lot of women, yeah. even the status of the women were quite be, low, being even a, in being general. A, being a nurse hadn't yeah. great status until the early 20th century. Yeah. Um, and the, 
There was a case in 1900 where a patient who had escaped from the building, that's how it was referred to, escaped, uh, was found drowned in the canal just up at the Dublin Bridge. You only got uh, that far. Uh, and the, 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 were, the nurses were criticised uh, for not spending enough time looking after their patients. Instead, they were uh, dancing with every Tom, Dick and Harry of a doctor. And there was apparently there was a, there was a ball held for the hospital staff in 1901, and the word went around that it was sort of I think they described it as a saturnalia of immorality, which sounds really terrible. Very well um, written, whoever wrote that. Uh, but that it's interesting the, that case of the patient who left the hospital and was found drowned in the canal that features in James Joyce's novel Stephen Hero, his first novel. Wow! And he describes the finding of the body of a woman in the canal, a patient from the hospital so vividly that I think he actually was there when that woman's body was taken out of the canal because mm. he was in Mullingar at the time it was in the summer of 1900 so I think he actually witnessed that Wow! Uh, he certainly wrote about it in his first novel Yeah, don't forget folks, James Joyce is down this town we have tons and tons mm. of history go way, 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 way back Oh yeah, and um, the hospital was run. There was an asylum committee, and that was made up <laughs> of quite doctors, mad, yeah. <laughs> doctors, local landowners. Originally, what was called the Grand Jury of Westmeath, who were the landlords who ran the county before yeah. uh, county councils were established. Uh, the poor law guardians who also ran the workhouse, and then when the county councils and what were called rural district councils were set up in 1899, they took over the running of it, uh, and there's. Uh, members of Parliament also served on the board and there was an absolutely hilarious case in 1918 where this hospital featured in a question put to a minister in the House of Commons in London. Remember we were part of the UK at that time. Ah, right, yeah. So one of the Longford MPs, Mr Farrell, uh, had a question because there was apparently coal that was supposed to come to the hospital here at a time when due to the war there were great shortages of the coal. Yeah. The coal ended up going to Guinness's brewery instead and Mr Farrell said that it was very important that lunatics, that was the word he used, even Irish lunatics, should be kept warm uh, and well fed and that they, they needed the coal more, more than the brewers in Dublin needed to make more Guinness. Amazing. So we featured in the House of Commons in Once again, folks, if you're out there watching in and there's lots of people looking in, just press that share button and share this to the world because, as I said, we're here with Mullingar's historian, a legend, ladies and gentlemen, telling us so many stories. This lady has so much to give to all you out there, so just mm -hmm. share this, please. And it's, you know, the, the, gradually the hospital expanded. There was a big extension in 1939. Mm. Uh, it opened in 1939. It was opened by the then health minister who later became president of Ireland, Sean T. O'Calley. It's um, curious, one of the men who worked on the building of the extension mm -hmm. um, later went on to meet a rather tragic end. Oh. Uh, he was hanged for murder. He was a guy called McCormack, who right. was from this town, and he and oh, another man, yeah. Barnes and McCormack, who were executed in Birmingham in 1940 for their part in the Coventry bicycle bombing, which killed five people the previous summer. Uh, from he from Mullingar? He was. McCormack was from Mullingar. We're uh, all from Mullingar, folks. Uh, Barnes was an awfully man, but of course they're both buried now over in Valley Glass. But he, uh, uh, McCormack, before he went to England, actually worked on the building here, which was partly paid for out of the famous hospital sweepstakes, uh, which were brought in in the early 1930s. It was kind of a forerunner to the, the lotto that we have now. Uh, and Camille, where did all the stone come from? Like It looks fairly I cut was, and all that, doesn't it? It was. I think uh, quarries and various parts of Ireland, and there would have been, it would have been brought here mm -hmm. by railway. The railway had opened just a few years earlier, so that, that like the canal four decades earlier, where building materials were brought down to build things like the army barracks uh, and the courthouse. The railway was brought the building materials for here and it is really very high quality work. We'll just walk out here mm. because we're showing, we're talking about a building here that is, uh, it's magnificent. Oh, it is. And yeah. uh, it's not been used that much now, but it's been looked after fairly well. It is. It was, you know, it was in full use up yeah. until a few years ago when they gradually began to close the wards and move patients into new buildings or out into the community. Uh, the biggest number of patients ever in this building at any one time yeah. would have been in the late 50s. In 1959, there were just under 1,200 
wow. patients here. Just ask a question uh, here. That, is that very loud, that wind there, folks? And if anyone can just tell me if it's too loud and you can't hear us, just send us a message there, okay? Yeah. Sorry, Ruth, interrupting you again. Oh, no, that's good. Um, important. <laughs> so, um, and the, uh, the, first, the first member woman to serve in the asylum committee didn't take her seat until 1934. She was, uh, didn't take her seat? I mean, did, well, you, did she, you need she, a sorry. seat? We'll just go in here because it's um, getting windy again. I rephrase yeah. that. They didn't have any women on the, on the committee until yeah. 1934 uh, when a woman member of Meath County Council yeah. uh, w was, uh, took her seat by, by virtue of being a member of the, the County Council for one of the counties this uh, place looked after. Um, and the in 1935, they appointed the first female um, RMS, the, the person in charge of the hospital, the resident medical supervisor uh, and uh, or superintendent. Uh, but the uh, hospital said it gradually expanded, and it, uh, yeah. one of the great things that came in in the 1960s and 70s, they had boat building. Uh, yeah. the Peter Caffrey. Uh, he was one of the people involved with that, and that Thanks, was that was a brilliant. Thanks, um, uh, Helen. There, she said the sound isn't too bad, so we can move on another bit. Mm, yeah, Peter uh, Caffrey made some boats, and I did. think um, Larry Caffrey had some boats made here, or yeah, I mean, it was got it them was fixed a, up, you know. It was a great thing, that, and um, then of course, I mean, for the staff, I mean, you had things. There was the asylum band, uh, <laughs> which was there. There's a photograph of the asylum band taken about 1900. Right. Um, appear to have had women in, in the band so that was drawn I think exclusively from the staff but that's yeah. one of the rivers I said that flows into the great Mullingar music scene from the, from all sorts of angles so the, the asylum band and of course in 1910 they found that the, the um, what for decades was known as the Asylum GAA Club which is now of course St Lomans oh, uh, right, but it started yeah, yeah. out as, as Mental Hospital I think was the, the, yeah. it was known as for years uh, exactly the Mental Hospital but I mean it was yeah that's the word that everyone would say around yeah. town uh, the name in St Lomans that was not um, didn't come into use until 1960 right uh, about the beginning of the 60s uh, it was felt that it would be a good idea to start naming uh, the asylums, give them new names, stop calling them asylums, start calling them hospitals. Yeah. And they were given saints' names and the wards were given saints' names as well. Uh, the Catholic chapel here dates back to 1887. Wow, uh, and 1887. It, yeah, and it was uh, again the work of Charles Wilkinson, the original architect. Wow. Um, Church of Ireland community didn't have a chapel as such until the 1960s, oddly enough, um, Canon right. Ian MacDougall requested that a chapel be provided. Up to then they were apparently using the boardroom for services. Uh, so what Church of Ireland church was added at that time. Um, so that was under English occupation, so that's, the, that's where that uh, yeah, church I mean, had come the, in? The, the church originally, I mean, as I said, when this asylum was built, this mm -hmm. was part of Britain. Um, yeah. And... Uh, the uh, Mental Health Acts were acts which were passed by the British Parliament. Where after independence, we began to get our own laws, although there was a major Mental Health Act passed in 1945. Right. Um, and one of the main influences on that act was a woman from this town. She never worked here, although she was a psychiatrist, uh, Dr. Ada English. Ada English. Because English is still in the town as well. Yeah, Dr. Ada English grew up in what's now Danny Burns. Oh, uh, right, yeah. Her father was a pharmacist and a member of the town commission in Mullingar. Yeah. And Ada English was one of the first female doctors in Ireland and certainly one of the first women to work in psychiatric medicine. She lectured in the subject in Galway University. Okay. Uh, she represented Galway University in, in the Dáil in 1921-22. Yeah. But she she worked in Ballinasloe, or what was then referred to as the Connacht District Asylum. But she would have visited here on a couple of occasions for conferences. She would have known the senior staff here. Brilliant. Well, we're just going to swing around here now and just to, to see you there, folks. You can see the uh, famous, famous, famous church. You can see the church, you can see some of the buildings here, some of the modern buildings, of yeah. course. Which, and of course, one of the great things which happened in the 1970s, 80s was the lowering of the walls. 
Oh because yeah. Before that, this really was kind of like a prison and would have been seen as a play, a rather frightening place. Yeah, exactly. Um, when my when my mother worked here, she had to climb the walls to get out. They were nearly, you know, yeah, they were very, you know, it was, it was really, everything. yeah, and there were very, you know, there were strict rules and staff, mm. of course, female staff would have had to resign on marriage up until I think the early seventies because That's correct, they were covered yeah. by the notorious marriage ban, um, and the. But the whole, the attitude towards, you know, mental health began to gradually change. I mean, there were enlightened staff members, even in the 60s, who used to bring patients home, maybe bring them for Christmas dinner, or mm. just to so that people would know, don't be frightened of these people, you know, they're not, they're not a, a threat to you. Exactly, uh, yeah. The language in earlier decades is, you know, it's crude. That's the best way of putting it. I mean, there's a report in the Westminster Examiner 1907 and it, the, the heading is lunatic escapes from asylum and then there are all these things about and the lunatic was seen heading out the Lynn Road and the lunatic was followed by keepers in the, yeah. and eventually the poor man who seems to have been trying to head back to wherever he came from, from you know was brought back again but the, you know it's such a, that, that was the language of the, the era I mean, wow. in, uh, unfortunately and they um, one of the people here uh, for many years in the 50s and the early 60s, of course, was the great historian uh, of Mullingar, Leo Daly. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Le Leo, Leo worked here and um, he sort of, he, he often used his experiences here in some of the novels and short stories that he yeah. wrote um, because uh, I think he, he left in part because I think he, he began to feel that if he spent too long working here, he might end up as a patient. <laughs> he actually said, so, you know, it could be, I think, a quite depressing place, particularly for someone, you know, like me, who was quite a sensitive person. Exactly, yeah. Well, once again, folks, you're out there, uh, and please share this. As I say, just there's a share button down the corner there, and share it with everyone that you know, because we're getting great history here from Ruth Illingworth, Wollongar's historian. And uh, you're lecturing yourself in Minute as well, are you? There a day, a, a half a week, yeah, yeah, and I'm just finishing off a, another book at the moment. Oh, brilliant. What's yeah. the new book about? It's about childhood in 1950s Ireland. Wow. A uh, place where, you know, there the were good sides and bad sides to childhood in the 1950s. Yeah. Kind of the dark side included the extraordinary large numbers of people, including children who were sort of incarcerated in all kinds of institutions including asylums and county homes and yeah. uh, all the other ones and the, you know it, we, we do seem in Ireland to have made quite a habit of locking people up you know <laughs> so, um, get up to your room what, and lock in <laughs> one, one of the ways in which this was a really kind of uh, pioneering place was this was one of the very first buildings in Mountain Garden of Electric Light expensive to extend gas pipelines from the gas works in Mill Road up to here so they had to little generators and things but they decided to go with electric light and the they talked in 1892 about you know, the magic of you know, the great illumination of electric light and yeah. the railway station was the next building to get to. Wind so, is getting so bad there again coming in and our in the fear of put on this yoke could make a difference maybe. But look Ruth, you have a lot coming on. Bad sound, yeah, quite bad sound. Thanks for that folks, whoever's saying that. Um, how's that now? We'll try and go in a little bit yeah, more. No, but you see here um, Ruth yeah. in the background, there's just this big, big, big tower. What was that tower for? The tower was put in in 1895 and again I, th I think it was part of the whole system of uh, of boilers and laundries that they had here, they did an enormous laundry. Yeah. And it's one of the landmarks of Mullingar. I mean, it was repaired in the mid 50s, but it's still standing there. Exactly, yeah. Uh, and, and it's made of um, brick. It's made of brick. Which yeah. is a, a big, big um, job to do that in yeah. um, them days. Because it, it goes it up very high. It does, and it looks like kind of, you know, part of an industrial thing that you yeah. it's, you'd associate more with somewhere like, you know, the north of England than an Irish Midlands town. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, there were said, staff living here. There was uh, um, various staff members, had senior staff members and people involved with things like looking after the, the heating systems and the lighting and 
uh, that had their own homes along here. There was a Mr. Thorpe, for example, he, Charles Thorpe. He and his family lived here around the early 1910s. A bit of noise in here, they must be doing a bit of work. So there's still obviously work and there's still bits and bobs being. Um, yeah, so, so parts I of this are still, you know, they're uh, a working building. I think they've nearly finished here. I think all, nearly everything has been moved out of here at this yeah. stage. Maybe just them with the heaters or the foot. Yeah. yeah. Don't forget, folks, you're out there and you're watching. Just share this. Just mm. press that share button and, and see how many people we can share this to yeah. in one and evening. And just as I said, for people, I know there may be a problem with noise. That Yeah. Uh, just to repeat again, that this was one of the first buildings in Mullingart of electric light as early wow. as 1892. 1892? 1892. Yeah. 1892. Because, because four or five years later, at a town commission meeting, a councillor Stafford was talking about getting electric light for the town and saying, you know, this electricity thing is going great. You know, so he thought he'd get a vision of the town with electric light. And how would, they, up here. how would they generate that electricity? They had their own generators and they used, um, I think Diesel they used steam and coal, I think. For, steam and coal to make yeah, your own electricity. Yeah, so they, they were really very self-sufficient here. Well, come here now. We're just going to go through a few of the messages here, Ruth. A lot of people coming in, so uh, that's better. Uh, brilliant information, a uh, lady knows her history. That's right, Jerry. Mm -hmm. Share it there with just press that share button and let it off. Amelda, my ah, yeah, we're distance now. So we just got knocked off. Your mother was a nurse there back in the 40s and 50s. She, her name was Mary Gallagher. Oh, brilliant! Thanks a million for that. Uh, as I said. We'll try and get out of this wind again. We, it's, yeah. it's between signals and wind. Signal, <laughs> this is the yes. technology we have nowadays. <laughs> signals and wind. Yeah, but uh, yeah, as I said, it was a place of one of the town's biggest sources of employment. Was up yeah, exactly. Um, and it was really, it became almost like a family business. I mean, people, you know, their parents met. Generation there, went through and with then yeah. their children followed them into the, yeah. the, the same profession. Because um, I remember um, talking to Mr. Buckley down there mm -hmm. and they used to go down and change their checks there, you see. Yes. And yeah. uh, so that's where, as I said, that would be the where everything was going on. So yeah. they'd all buy their groceries and he'd, oh, wow. he'd change the checks, you see, as well. Yes. We just pull in here now and I think mm -hmm. we're out of the signal. Um, what have we got here now? Where is the building? Where is the building? What is that? Uh, where is that building? Is that St. Lomans? I'm messaging from Melbourne. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Sean, it is indeed. It's the... It's the, the, the old St. Lomans complex yeah. buildings. Uh, lost signal there, but we hope we're back. Just send me a message to see if you're back again. We'll just run through a few of the messages here. Uh, Helen Edwards says, How do you remember all those facts? <laughs> I just do. <laughs> it interests me, so I remember them. Oh, great. We got thumbs up there. Uh, uh, such an amazing historian thanks Imelda uh, hi Imelda uh, love listening to her great history well share it there if you love listening send it out there um, Anne Kiernan how's it going and Helen how's it going uh, a lot of people looking in Helen uh, not too bad thanks for that uh, Gabriel Conlon hi from Dublin Ray and Ruth hi, hi from Mullingar yeah How's my hair look? <laughs> Wind has ruined my hair. <laughs> uh, Philomena Burke, how's it going? Keith uh, James Fisher, good man. Thank you. Mary Riley, uh, Amanda Murray. Amanda Murray watching this. Another fantastic story from Ruth. Well, there you are. We're going to put our channel up. Mm -hmm. You'll be able to check her out on Facebook. We put all these videos on it and you can watch all the great stories of Ruth. Fantastic. The life of Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> fantastic lady. So knowledgeable. Absolutely. Uh, Amanda Murray, how's it going? Uh, and Bernadette Clark and Sally Taylor. So look, good evening. Uh, who's saying good evening? Would you go down to and have a look there? Good evening. That's from Kathleen. Mm -hmm. And yes, back again, Ray. Brilliant. Mental Hospital, that's it, Susan. That's where we are. Mm -hmm. So this is Ray Dolan going live with Ruth Dillingworth. Check her out, as I said. She's loads of information. She's a new book coming out. What's it called again? Uh, Childhood in 1950s Ireland ah. with the History Press. So what we'll do is we'll do... We're going to make a channel for Ruth on face on YouTube. And we'll put all the information on it. And you want to check it out, just we'll put some information up here. <laughs> so good luck. Uh, so we're... So this is such a historic place and it was such an important part of the town. I mean, there were houses built 
primarily for staff who worked here. I think Assumption Villas beside oh, yeah. St. Lomans was built primarily for asylum staff. Uh, oh, and okay. of course it was a great source of employment uh, and that applied to generations of families. It was a bit like you know the military and the railway and the asylum. It was, there were the know, three was businesses of Mullingar at that time, really folks. Big businesses. Colin Smullen, town. how's it going? And Trevor McDonald and Sean Bioreen Breen. Yeah, I am Ben Dolan's son. Do I look like him? So we're going <laughs> to drop out here and see us, folks, because we're just going to start the rain here. This is Ray and Ruth. Talk to you soon. Houston.